thank you for joining us for technology tools. Sorry, my to engage children in science and social studies during distance learning sessions. So this is learning how to apply apps and tech tools and story grammar marker and theme maker digital icons um, for expository text. So this is um, again presented by Mary Ellen Morrow and Sean Sweeney and welcome to Sean and welcome to all of you. Um, we are so grateful to have you here. We hope you're all well and we, um, we are happy to be able to provide this training for you. You will be able to download from our website, mindwingconcepts.com, a handout. You can get the PowerPoint slides and also receive a certificate of attendance that can be applied to you, your certification maintenance hours. And um, people had that question throughout the presentation, so I just wanna make sure that you know from the outset that you will be able to download those slides. So um, I'm gonna just get to the next slide, which is something that we had showed in the last presentation, but people really got a lot out of this slide. A child's successful completion of many academic tasks depends on the ability to bring linear order to chaos of daily experience. And I think that many of us are experiencing a bit of a chaotic daily experience and whether that's um, in our everyday lives or in our heads, we have so much going on, whether it's what we're thinking, what we're feeling, um, what we're remembering, what we know, um, the kickoffs that are happening, all the th the actions that we have to take, the things that we have to accomplish, um, how we have to resolve um, problems and deal with conflict. All of this is kind of the very core of, of what we do and who we are has really been tested during this time. And what we want to do with Story Grammar Marker and Theme Maker is to be able to bring this chaos, whatever kind of chaos is going on, to, to, to a stop and to more of an order so that, you know, any of us, you know, wherever we happen to be in our homes, most likely, or at work, you know, when things happen that change our ho-hum day or become kickoffs and make us feel in a different way, whether it's upset or happy or um, or any way that or nervous or whatever way it happens to be that we have a, a, a linear organized way to think about things and to remember and to believe and to um, to know um, in order to make a plan in order to be planful in what we do on a daily basis and then to be able to talk about the things that we'll do to carry out a plan whatever that plan is from getting homework done to how we're going to get groceries to you know what we're going to do if someone is sick to anything and as a result hopefully the tie up will be that you know we'll be able to have a conversation and make a plan and solve a problem and the resolution will be that things are better and not as chaotic and more organized um, for us to handle um, and cope with things that are going on. And this isn't just now, this is always. So um, that is what we're hoping for you by using Story Grammar Marker. And today we're gonna get more into expository text and I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Ellen to get started. So thank you. Sean will be joining us in a little bit. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, it's nice to see everybody from all our, lots of our previous workshops. So I just wanted to, after you saw what Sheila had uh, presented um, and created, I wanted to just quickly mention the names of the icons. The name of the icon is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much below that that we teach. But the initiating event is the problem or the excitement, something that changed the whole home setting. The internal response, the mental state verbs, very important to communicate our thoughts. The plan, which is a hand <clears throat> to stop, think, and make a plan. The attempts to carry out that plan. The bow at the end, the way things turned out, 
and if they were what we wanted or not. And if we didn't want it to turn out that way, maybe we'd change our attempts or maybe we'll have to change our plan. And at the end, there's a resolution, a time to reflect. How did things turn out? So this is the basic story grammar marker, um, which is, was primarily at first used for narrative. But today we're going to talk about the coronavirus, um, COVID-19, which is CO from corona, VI from virus, and D from disease, the year 2019. And this is a pandemic. So when we look up pandemic, pandemic is of Greek origin. Pan means all and demos means people. So it's all over for all people. The pronunciation depends on the phonology. There's morphology, there's syllables in there for pandemic. The word is also an adjective if it's we're looking at the semantics of it it describes something something can be of pandemic proportions so the disorganization we feel right now is of pandemic proportions widespread pervasive rampant universal tier three words i think um it's also a noun an outbreak of a pandemic disease a pandemic and uh, a pandemic is the name of something that is spread throughout the world. So this is our topic today. And I wanted to mention at the beginning that it, just a point of interest, I came from a family, my, of my father's family. Um, he was one of nine children and um, four of them were very, very good writers for some reason and they became interested in the newspaper business. He was a um, teacher at a high school and then an administrator, but he always stayed as the correspondent from, the Ludlow, from Ludlow, Massachusetts, into the Springfield papers, which at one time had three papers a week, and now they have the Springfield Republican. Um, so as the correspondent to that, paper, it made it evident in my house that we had to, when the phone rang, take the message that somebody might give. And um, my mother would type it, my father and I, or one of my brothers or sister would bring it into the newspaper at night. And the editors with their green visors would look it over and they would put the headlines on it. And I often, or my father often mentioned the power of the headline. A lot of people just read headlines. They don't really read the article that's under it. And sometimes the wrong headline would go on, um, maybe because it was misinterpreted by the editor or whatever, and whoever wrote the article or wanted it in was not happy. But that didn't happen very, very often. But um, as we're looking at um, students um, of higher levels who are looking at historical facts, um, they really are delving into um, what do we think about that title? What do we think about the headline? So the headlines were important. And one of his, um, one brother was a sports writer. The other uh, two, um, one of them created their own newspaper with their wife, um, Emmett and Helen Rooney, the Register from Ludlow. It still exists, although it's not family owned. And uh, it's a weekly newspaper. And the, um, my uncle Davitt from Palmer um, bought the Palmer Journal Register and um, went on with that. So I just wanted to mention that because it was kind of a unique background. And it became very evident to me that I thought something should be done with information text when I started to do the story grammar marker. So if one of the other things, and I'm talking fast because I want to allow for our other participants, but one of the other things my father would say is if you want to get a good idea about a topic that you were assigned in school, a project, a topic, try to get a children's book on it because the children's book will probably be presenting the basics of information and maybe it would be in a story which makes it easier to understand. 
fact was his thought. So anyway, I put this into a story. The characters are the world population, the setting, the countries of the world. The kickoff, COVID-19 became an epidemic. And of course it was a novel virus, even though we had coronaviruses before, this was very different. The feeling of everybody involved was fear, worry, frustration, but underlying that there was the hope. What did we think? We thought there would be advances in research, or there are. We realized a vaccine was um, going to be developed. We believed that hospitalizations would eventually slow. We knew that there are new ways to fight viruses. Our plans, what was it? We intended to overcome this as a world and by doing our best in our roles as workers and citizens in general. The attempts, the healthcare, first responders, medical workers, their focus was saving lives. So what did they do to carry out this plan? The government leaders, um, agencies protecting us, making policies like social distancing, ordering different cities and people in different places to wear masks, school and business closures, school from home, stimulus funds to help small businesses. We have counselors um, who did their role to toward a resolution by helping people cope. My husband is one of them. Um, teachers, SLPs, administrators, all educators teaching our children, but teaching in a vastly different way from what they were used to. Parents working at home, teaching, keeping children safe and healthy at home. Some of that teaching that parents were doing, they weren't used to. All essential workers doing their jobs through it all to bring us what we need to survive. And as a result, because of doing all of those things, which were in our plan as a world, uh, in time we will overcome this pandemic. The resolution will feel well, stay safer, and we'll continue to be prepared through the lessons learned and we'll live our life. So it was 1995 that um, the theme maker, the first theme maker was published. It's been revised since then, but it has always focused on these structures of information text. Um, Holly Fidrich and Brian Welch were um, contributors to the theme maker manual. And I thought there has to be a way to use the same icons for a different purpose. This purpose is to look at an information piece. The information piece would be the facts. And those facts would be organized by the people who wrote them in the way they wanted them to be organized. It wouldn't necessarily be a story, although there may be stories interspersed throughout um, the uh, information text to make things um, more relative to the person reading it. So what is expository text? And people call it informational text as well. It's found in textbooks, history, geography, social studies, science, technology. And we are the characters in history right now. Um, the, also, we are the characters in science, some of us who are trying to find new ways to even to teach. Um, with technology. So um, we are the characters in our own history. Expository text is particularly important for organizing and comprehending information in all of these areas that are in front of us, particularly the internet and in everyday life, even on cereal boxes. The basic information or informational text structures are Description, compare, contrast, which is the most common one in the United States. Listing, sequencing, cause effect, problem solution. And because of the relation between problem solution and having to defend your solution, I always include persuasion and argument among them because it's a natural flow. 
expository language, which we're talking about, is key. And it's a key medium through which academic knowledge is constructed. In fact, it's called academic knowledge, academic conversations. Um, it's also the primary means through which children's academic literacy is demonstrated and assessed in intermediate grades and beyond. Um, Fong, in an article 2008 from the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, notes that it's imperative that more attention be given to the discourse features. That means the organizational structure and how they're related to academic conversations of this type of language. Without an understanding of the features of this type of text, students will be severely handicapped in reading and permanently left behind in schooling because so much of the curriculum is this text later on. So I often show these building blocks of language as a beginning slide in any presentation I give. Uh, it shows that oral language is the foundation for literacy. And the components of oral language, the pragmatics of the situation, the phonology, the semantics, the syntax or the word order in sentences, all combine at discourse. So the discourse level is kind of the intersection between oral language and thought. And without that discourse level, there's not a great connection to literacy. So part of the discourse level that we're talking about today is exposition, but the narrative is the beginning of the road toward that. So these are the text structures of conversation, narrative, and exposition. I always talk about the seven stages of narrative development so that people who are looking at uh, stories can analyze the story. If we're looking at a child who's not able to tell a story or write a story, we may look at where they are along that um, those seven stages of narrative and then target our intervention. But if you're good at narrating, you become a better conversationalist. And if you're good at narrating at the complete episode where you can tell an episode, you'll have the basic problem solution structure that is vital for information text. So, this is what it looks like and we have different things like um the theme maker manual comes with a, a student uh, folder that has the story and information text and the vital critical thinking triangle inside the theme maker manual has tutorials in it um lessons that are for beginning students in information text. And there are also maps, which they're graphic organizers, but we call them maps because they have the icons on them. And they are the beginnings of children formulating their own graphic organizers later. But at the beginning, it's great to put our thoughts down opposite an icon. And for older students, the icons are small and they're in grayscale. So anyway, this is what the transfer of the story grammar marker icons into information text looks like. Uh, the text structures are the foundations of discourse. So that's primarily what we're going to talk about today. We have the narrative text structures and we have information text structures. I'd like you to notice that um, words that are important for the different text structures, cohesive words, cohesive ties, are written in the little blocks. For instance, compare, contrast has words like different, unlike, however, same, alike, similar, both. And if you notice that, different is at the top and same is at the bottom. I found that my students were always better at knowing what was different. So I'd like to start with that. 
And then they couldn't fit things into the Venn diagram. So this is a good way um, to start. So we have cohesive tie words for each of the text structures and also a, a symbol of a plan at the bottom of each of the boxes. And it says the author's plan. The author's plan, if it's a description, is to describe a topic and focus on the character and the setting. The setting could be an era. So each of them has that as well. And what I love is this graphic um, that Sheila created for me about the intersection of narrative and expository text development. And this is something that I'd like you to digest when you get your handout. Um, because the narrative stages are going to be on the blue bar and the expository text structures are going to be on the yellow bar. Both of them intersect at the color green and green will show the text structure that ties them both together. So if a child that you're working with in narrative development is able to do character and setting, now, depending on how old they are and all of that, they should be able to give a character description in information text and also do some elementary comparing and contrasting. If they have an action sequence competence, character, setting, and a series of actions, they should be able to list and sequence. And listing and sequence can be very simple. It can be listing the things that you need for an art project and then sequencing the art project. Now this morning, Casey, my granddaughter, had a wonderful presentation from her art teacher on how to draw, um, how to paint with watercolors, a vase and flowers. So it was wonderful. And it was very, very explicit. So getting back to, in, in fact, the descriptive sequence, um, I often mention Margaret Wise Brown. And in my many lessons that I'm doing daily throughout this um, COVID crisis on Facebook, um, I just did a series of lessons on Big Red Barn, where there are characters in the setting, and they're the farm animals at the barn. But one of the pages has a whole display of the winged animals on the farm. Those animals have two feet, where there are four-legged animals, four feet, four-footed animals like the pigs, the um, sheep, and the horses. So there's a compare contrast there. If a student is able to give a kickoff and a reaction, in a reactive sequence, that's the beginning of the causal chain in a narrative. That the kickoff is a cause of something. And it applies to information text because we have cause and effect. The hurricane caused power outages. The abbreviated episode also relates to cause effect because the abbreviated episode, one of the effects is feelings. Now, it's not to say that someone involved in an information text um, write-up doesn't have a feeling. Abraham Lincoln certainly did. Our world leaders have feelings and are trying to um, make plans as a result of those. Where everything comes together, expository text, um, once you have cause and effect, the effects may become a problem. And those problems have to be solved. So the complete episode is when there's a problem in a story, which really doesn't have to be a problem. It's an initiating event, which is just um, not the whole hum day happening. So it could be an excitement. In information text, typically there's a problem. And of course, we use the same structure to work through a problem in real life. So um, problem solution, you'll notice on expository text, on the expository text maps, is the same setup as the complete episode in narrative. 
as we go on to get higher level in um, information text and higher level in narrative, stage six of a narrative is a complex episode where we judge the piece or the children's um, retelling or writing as having more than one kickoff, like a novel. Um, in real life, the fact that we know there's more than one kickoff, that can make us better able to persuade somebody or to have to make an argument. So a persuasion is kind of based on feelings more than um, knowledge. Arguments are based on knowledge. It's a knowledge base. So we have to supplement it with that. And then the highest level of narrative is interactive episode, where if you look at the little figures, the character on the left did something. This could be something in the world. Somehow the COVID virus. Um, and that had an effect on another person or group of people who had a feeling about it and made a plan. That figures into persuasion and argument because it requires perspective taking. So through narrative development, we work on the development of taking perspective. In persuasion and argument, it's necessary to take perspective. And it all relates to the building of the problem solution text structure. So I love this animation that Sheila made for me and um, wanted to um, present it tonight. So this is from a map, Deepening Discourse and Thought, uh, a uh, chart that we have that shows just what Sheila had in um, animation on the last slide on the right. It shows how narrative and expository text can be grouped together as a way of intervention. So teaching children common expository text structures is really necessary as well as how to create visual representations of these structures. And that facilitates comprehension, which aids in both reading and writing, and I might say oral language comprehension. A skill that's most important for constructing a coherent mental model of the text meaning is knowledge and use of text structure. Knowledge and use of, so modeling it, explicit intervention. Knowledge of both narrative and expository text structure emerges in preschool, where we talk about routines. That's a sequence of events in the routine, but it's refined over many years through exposure, varied genres, and reading. And that's a quote. Um, via the International Dyslexia Association in their Perspectives magazine by um, Kate Kane of Kane and Oak Hill in the UK. So um, this kind of completes my part. And I just want to welcome you to this um, workshop and this webinar, I guess it is, uh, from our home in Western Mass. And I'd like to thank Sean, who's coming from Eastern Mass. Uh, via technology to present. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheila Morrow, and I am coming back after Mary Ellen to touch base with you about um, doing some expository text with our new digital icons, which are amazing and i'll show you at the end how to get access to those on our website um, you can purchase uh, the digital icon set which has 130 icons and images um, you can purchase um, individual sets if those if that's what you prefer but i'll show all of that to you at the end right now i'd like to share my screen and show you how i would use the icons in a distance learning lesson or session. 
And um, what I'm going to, what I've done here is I've put the icons or what icons I think I'm going to use for this lesson over on the side, if you can see on the left hand side of my, of my screen and I'm using PowerPoint here. And what I'm doing is I'm, so I'm giving a prompt. What is COVID? Now we're all pretty well versed right now in um, what we are in, um, probably everything having to do with COVID because we're all living and breathing it. Um, well, hopefully not literally. Hopefully we're feeling well, but we're immersed in, in knowledge about it and, and what we hear. So what is COVID? And if we were just gonna do like a, like a topic splash here, um, I would use the topic icon from Story Grammar Marker. And then I would just start to type in, I would take my um, text box from up here and I would start to type in um, virus. Uh, or like, I know they keep calling it the novel, the novel virus, novel virus. Um, uh, COVID is actually called um, coronavirus. So I'm going to bring that in. Um, somebody else said a disease, a pathogen. Um, okay. Somebody else said a respiratory infection. Another person said deadly. Another person said contagious. Another person said pandemic. Um, and so if we, this is a lot of information that we have and we could categorize that information. Um, but this is essentially um, this text structure here, descriptive. It's describing a person, an animal, a thing, a time a, or a place. And um, we would use these cohesive ties for that. So, you know, the co coronavirus is a novel virus. Um, in addition to that, it is a disease with pathogens. Um, it's such, uh, it, for, for instance, it causes respiratory infections. In addition to that, it's contagious. Um, it's also become a pandemic, you know, however, I mean, I'm just kind of picking around because we're going kind of quickly through this. Um, so that would be how I would do this. And now I'm going to do the similar thing. Um, I could have you read paragraphs, but I thought it would be more interesting to do it this way so that you could really get a chance to see um, how I would use these to have an academic conversation, a scaffolded um, discussion, maybe pre-teaching something um, to help our students when they get to the point of the, um, get to the point of studying something, whether it's science or social studies like Mary Helen had just mentioned. Um, so um, you could read something, but I just figured we'd use this topic because it is science and social studies, and we all are so immersed in this that we know so much about it. And so it's a great way to have an academic conversation and to structure that conversa conversation. So when we talk about the COVID-19 shutdown process, um, what I was thinking that this would be, I'd like, like to talk about the sequence of how this all happened. And yes, you'll have access to the, to the slides. Um, and I'll talk to you about, about how to purchase at the end also. Um, so for the sequence, I was thinking what I heard first was Disney World closed. And right around then, Okay, so then somebody else said school closed for two weeks. Um, my St. Patrick's Day parade was closed. Closed borders. Oh, it was about 22 weeks. Uh, travel restrictions. Closed borders. No, I just wrote in orders. Borders. Um, let's see. Church is closed. 50% at restaurants. News reports from around the world. News reports from all over world. Like non-essential business 
closed. So curfews, social distance. And we just heard, I know for us, the virtual school, yes. So we just heard, oh yeah. So we just, and we just heard school closed for the year. That was a big one. So, so all of these, and you can actually also, if you want to, this is, this is a sequence. So I would really actually say, you know, if I was going to be doing this in, and I wanted to get that content, you can also use these icons, the content icons. Uh, I mean, the sequence icons here. Um, and thank you for all these other, um, God, we really do know a ton of information about this pandemic. Um, so you can manipulate these icons. These are the, these are the sequence icons. So we have way more than five, but if you were doing this in a lesson, you'd probably use the icon and then type next to it. Um, I'm trying to do this obviously in a, in like a 10 minute <laughs> burst. So I hope this is okay for you all to kind of see how this works. So next, what, why don't we talk about this? The problem, I think, was the shortage of masks. So this is gonna be a problem solution structure. So there was a problem, the problem was a shortage of masks. How were people feeling? I mean, if you were somebody who worked as a, a medical professional, you know, what were some feelings that people were having? Um, if you, my sister's the a head nurse manager um, at a big hospital, um, and luckily her hospital was prepared, but um, abandoned, um, nervous. I'm just gonna write a couple because horrified, yeah, angry. Some people are hopeful, yes. Now, what about um, your, your thought, I mean, and I think we've had, I'm, I, we've had, we had a lot of thoughts because, you know, our thoughts are, where are they going to come from? I mean, so many different thoughts. And so what were some of the plans that, oh, distrust? Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. So people planned to, to get masks. I love that someone just wrote, start sewing. I thought that was a, one of the most amazing things I've seen. So many individuals started sewing. Um, and then does anybody know, does anybody know um, what happened in Massachusetts? Um, who went to China to get more masks and equipment? Patriots. Um, Bob Kraft, you're right. And we live here, that's why we're so proud. Um, and 3M, and 3M also um, collaborated with that, and they went to China to get masks, and so many individuals, students started making um, PPE on their laser printers. Mm -hmm. um, we had all kinds of companies, um, uh, car companies, automotive, auto companies making all kinds of textiles, industry changed. Um, so I, I think that these are the kind of things that when you can have this kind of toy company switched over to making masks, my friend Amy and my friend Linda have both made hundreds of masks. And my, oh, my friend Barb have all made hundreds of masks for people because everybody has to wear them. And so this, see, this is a way of talking about a problem and a solution. I love that. People pulled together people pulled together. And so that was the direct consequence, right? And sorry, this is all over the page, but like I said, it would be more organized if we were probably, or maybe it wouldn't if you were with your students, it probably would be like this. People pulled together and, um, as a re and the resolution is, you know, I guess we're, um, we are, we've learned that I guess really the lesson learned is that we can, we can really do anything. I mean, we really can. This has been an unbelievable, so many things that have happened have been awful, um, but so many things have been incredible. And this is a, a conversation about that. Um, let's move on to the next one. So I'm not, I don't wanna get too technical because I don't, I know we don't have a ton of time. Oh, I love that. 
we learned we can think outside the box. So the topic would be, so you'd have flu, and I'm just gonna show you, this would be compare and contrast, right? Is COVID-19 like the flu? So you'd probably wanna do, you know, COVID-19, and then the flu. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna type all your stuff in after so that I can, flu. And what you'd wanna do is make lists of all the things that were similar and all the things that were different. So I'm not gonna type these right now because I'm trying to get through it a little bit fast, but you know, we could say um, that COVID-19 um, was more had, was more contagious than the flu. That would be something different. They're both um, contagions that start with viruses. Um, they have similar symptoms, um, but some symptoms are different. So you can we could go through that um, in this way, comparing and contrasting. And this is how you'd be manipulating. Um, and then how is I know I'm getting a little bit over my time. I'm sorry, Sean. We might be going a little bit. Um, a little bit longer. Um, and I, I just want to quickly nope, show you no so problem for me too much into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but cause effect, how is, um, you know, COVID-19 spread? So, um, you know, one of the ways is what, um, if somebody coughs mm -hmm. and that causes droplets to spread in the air, um, if somebody with COVID touches something, and it's on their hands because they've touched their face, that causes there to be some remnants of COVID. Um, and so, other, uh, yes. Um, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. Hi, Jorge. Yes, and you know what? And Sean is gonna talk about some of that. Um, so I'm gonna leave that up to him. Um, so, Yes, thanks, Sean. And this one, finally, you know, how to slow the spread your, and protect yourself. And that's really a basic list. Um, and you can take, you know, the, these icons here and go through with your students and say, you know, first, you can do this, wash your hands, don't touch your face, wear a mask, do social distancing get your groceries delivered, et cetera. So I'm sorry I had to rush through that. Um, and then the final one that we were gonna do, but we'll, it's too, um, I'll put these up on the, um, on the handout, but argument, should schools be closed for the rest of the year? I know there was a lot of um, controversy about that. And this has to do with perspective taking and, um, and that kind of thing. So. I am going, I'm sorry that was so quick. Um, I am definitely going to make sure to, um, to have this in the handout so that you can see these. I'll fix them up a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna get you over to Sean. We're probably gonna run a little bit over, but we are recording it. So if you can't stay past uh, 3.30, then you can get it on, um, on the replay. So Sean, Yep, I'm just stuck my video there. Oh, I can't. Oh, I've got to get. You can hear me. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I was just, uh, it's my own. All right, yeah. cool. I'm sorry, just gonna... I ran, sorry, I ran over. Of course, I oh, always go. Oh, over. gosh, don't worry. Uh, I probably will, too. And that was a really awesome demonstration. So um, as Sheila was, uh, was demonstrating there, there's a lot of different um, what to's that you can do. Uh, with their icon sets. So Mindwing has recently just put those icons um, available on the website. They're very inexpensively packaged, I think, and you can either buy a, a, the universal set or just the theme maker ones um, at, at different um, levels. But I'm gonna be talking a bit about the technology piece. Um, so you know, I'm a speech and language pathologist as well, and uh, have an instructional tech background. And over the last uh, 10 years, I've had, uh, I've learned from some of the best uh, uh, folks up in Maine at Waldo County General Hospital. We've got, had a collaboration and even though I was not doing telepractice myself, I was you know, having a, a consultation with them and doing some training for them and attending some of their trainings on 
how to use technology in, um, in delivering speech and language pathology service, services through uh, telepractice. And um, I continue doing in-person therapy primarily at the Ely Center in Needham, um, Mass, after working in the public schools for about 10 years myself. So um, I've been uh, all over the place. And um, the, you know, I always had said, I, I'm not a telepractitioner, but I play one on TV because I'm helping them with the IT aspect of things. Um, that changed really quickly in March. Uh, and um, my workplace is now uh, doing all teletherapy, of course, and about 90% of my caseload jumped into that. So that was a, a blessing for sure. Um, so through this, uh, these are going to be in the, the slide package that um, Chilo puts up with the handouts. And uh, I've always also had um, a big interest in um, educational relevance in, in speech and language therapy um, and finding ways to intersect with the with students' um, topic areas that they have. It. Um, and I think particularly science studies are, are pretty rich because there's so much language um, that's available in those, uh, in those topics. Um, so uh, this topic is close to um, pieces that I, you know, have really liked to do um, over the years. So uh, Sheila really just demonstrated, a, you know, a chunk of what I did in the first webinar a few weeks ago um, about how to use the icon packages. And, um, you know, if you get the icons, they are downloadable in a PowerPoint file. Um, all you have to know how to do is cut and paste, okay? Um, because the PowerPoint file is downloaded to your computer and then you can just select any of the icons and cut and paste. What you saw Sheila doing there was using um, uh, PowerPoint. And that actually is one of my favorite tools to use or a PowerPoint-like tool. Um, I do a lot with Google Slides um, primarily and we all have Google Slides available to us. It's available in many school districts as well. Um, so you can create um, language maps around any topic using the icons that are available. Basically, that was also a really good model from Sheila um, that uh, it was a scaffolded conversation. So the icons provide a visual support for you to be questioning and organizing the language that students are generating into um, one, of the, one of those text structures. So, um, like I said, all you really need to know how to do is cut and paste uh, in order to do that. And um, just to do this a little bit in brief, I have the, um, the icons here in Keynote, okay? Um, and Keynote is Mac's PowerPoint, so it doesn't really matter. It's, it's semantics, okay? Uh, and I can just quickly multiple select and take all of these icons. I'm selecting them all. You do shift click. Um, lets you multiple select and to uh, copy. I like to use the keyboard shortcuts. You can look that up or you can go uh, edit copy. And then those are on what is called your clipboard and you can take those and put them anywhere you like. Um, I'm actually just gonna quickly demonstrate how to do this with, um, let's just do it on a blank slide like that. Um, this is Google Slides and if I go paste, Okay, so each of these are, uh, I will, I did them all together. So that made them, I like to have a, a little gaffe or, or a mistake. Um, so if I had done those individually, they would be movable individually, but for some reason, Google is putting them all together. Uh, but you get the idea. So uh, you can make your own, set them up um, how, how you would like. And what Sheila was demonstrating there was using, um, using uh, text boxes. I also love, just helps me organize and it can make things nice and colorful too. Um, in Google Slides or PowerPoint or Keynote using shapes. So um, I just went over here to the little shapes menu and made a rectangle. Shapes are your friend because they're typable. Um, you don't then have to put a text box on top of the shape. Um, you could do your first and then and next. And they're also copy and pasteable. So you can do this stuff really quick when you get used to it. All right, so I just copied and pasted that shape and then we can talk about um, what is going to be second. All right, and so forth. Um, so um, some of the questions were also around, uh, would you be able to have students directly involved with these icons um, and or directly involved with the slide that you're typing into? 
You can do all of this with um, Microsoft Word or Docs or Pages as well. Those are word processors, um, but you're definitely not going to be as easily able to move stuff around like you can here. All right, so that's one reason I find that presentation creators, even though you're not making a PowerPoint with bullets, are still your best bet on make, using these to make um, some language maps. Uh, having students have a direct hand in them or making them typeable for students can work in different ways. Um, if you're using Zoom, which uh, many telepractitioners are, um, you can um, give cursor control, that's called remote control, and then the student can type into what you're doing. Um, this is done best if the other student is on a laptop. It doesn't work at all on a Chromebook, and it works in very limited fashion on an iPad if the student is on an iPad. So keep that in mind. The other thing that you can do, though, is if you're doing this in Google Slides, you've got this option to share it with the student. Okay, so if you've got, you know, if you're working in a school district, usually when you type in a student name, it auto populates the student name and you don't have to know like track their emails. Um, and once you do that, if you give them editing capability, they can be working right with you and typing right into the same thing. So those are a couple of options there. I know that a lot of districts aren't using Zoom, they're using Google Hangouts Meet. That's an awkward name for a product. Um, but uh, that's what they've landed on for now. Um, and I don't like it at all as much, but that's what a lot of school districts are using. Uh, and it only allows you to screen share. However, you can share the document with the student and they'll be able to type into it too. Um, I'm not gonna do that much more how-to around this because um, very recently on the Mindwing blog, um, I did write a uh, how to, and this applies to all of the icons, and uh, it has information about how to use the icons. Um, so the icons are available on the website. All you really need to know how to do is cut and paste, and you can start um, <coughs> with your um, language maps and doing that. But just to give kind of another example here, um, let's take if you were making a list. I'll do a blank something. Do that one again. And I'm also going to talk about some helpful context online. Um, to make a list, you need the topic icon and then you need the beads, okay, in order to make it. Um, and putting a bead in here. All right, it's easy to resize them. Again, cut and paste is going to be your friend or copy and paste actually, is gonna be your friend and so on. And there are many, um, there are many contexts for expository um, language in science and social studies. Um, I actually first saw Mary Ellen present on this tool probably in um, about 2002. Um, and one of the suggestions that Mary Ellen had was more in the vein of ELA, uh, discipline wise. Um, and she mentioned how many advertisements have uh, expository text structures in them. And that idea um, was something I, I really liked and I wanted to run with it. And in a fifth grade um, program, uh, I started going into the classroom weekly, this was all of course in person, um, and doing uh, lessons about advertisements and the different text structures that were present in advertisement. Um, and a lot of you might know I'm a big Dunkin' Donuts person. I don't get there as much uh, now because um, <clears throat> Uh, you can also, in teletherapy, use your story grammar marker as a visual tool um, a lot, okay? You, got, you have to get used to that. If you move this way, it goes this way, whatnot, okay? You know, but because of the coronavirus and the worry of spreading, going to Dunkin' Donuts just isn't that much fun uh, because I receive the Dunkin' Donuts cup and then I have to wipe it down with my makeshift Clorox wipe because you can't get Clorox wipes anymore. So I created my own. Um, and I dump Clorox into a Clorox wipe thing, you know, container and there's paper towels. It's a big pain. All right. So, but I make my own Dunkin' Donuts and I like to put it in a Dunkin' Donuts cup. I'm a big Dunkin' Donuts person. They had this great series of ads. If you go on Google, I'm sorry, YouTube, and you look up Dunkin' Donuts, they might be giants. Um, you might've heard of they might be giants as a quirky band. Um, and they created a whole series of ads and they're all here in this one playlist 
Uh, and these are really fun to use because one of them is a list. Like for example, this lefty, loosey, righty, tidy one is a list of work that you do by twisting stuff, like uh, changing a tire or changing a light bulb or putting a table together. Um, and it doesn't say the list. You have to kind of notice the list. Um, and it was just a really good way to teach them. And if you look through the other ones, you'll find other text structures like sequence or cause and effect or problem solution. All of them basically are problem solution because they're saying that Dunkin' Donuts will help you do this particular thing. All right, so, um, but you also can use resources um, like Brain Pop. Okay, so Brain Pop and Brain Pop Junior. Um, many districts have these available and you'd have your subscription. Um, you may not be able to access that at this time. They offer a free um, subscription to people at this time. So um, there is a way for you to apply for free, but checking out this one, this is in Brain Pop Junior. There are great resources for noticing text structure. Um, and this one is about homes. Gosh, it says the video is timed out, that's okay. Um, this one is about homes and where's the video? Oh, it's hard on. quiz. Hold on, there we go, thank you. Um, so naturally just even seeing this title, you can guess that it's going to be a list of different, different types of homes. Uh, I'll pause for a second so you can hear some of it. Come on, Moby. It's time to go home. Moby, that's just a playhouse. But that isn't your real home. What is a home? A home is a place where you live. Our family lives in a house. My friend Emma and her family live in an apartment. Many people and families can live in the same apartment building. Some people so live in idea. mobile These homes. Animations are used to explore curriculum topics and they have a science category and a social studies category. And now that you know that these ways uh, of uh, teaching about expository text and visualizing it for students in um, in the graphic organizers or language maps that you can create with the icons is a scaffolding technique. And it's also an evidence-based scaffolding technique. And, and in the same way, like I had said, you really can just use story grammar marker itself because this is a list. So you can use the beads to uh, be a visual support um, or you can make something uh, that you're going to work on together that, that breaks it down a little bit more um, with students, okay? Um, so we talked here about that the icons can be put in Google Docs or Word or Pages or Google Slides or PowerPoint or Keynote uh, for creating uh, the, these kinds of scaffolded conversations. Um, but I'd also mention that if you purchase, say, the, the, um, the Theme Maker manual, it, within the first couple of pages of the manual, it gives you a link for downloading the graphic organizers. So in addition to using the icons themselves, you can download the PDFs of the graphic organizers. And there's a variety of ways to use these. PDFs we think of as non-writable, um, but that's actually sort of a, you know, a, a misconception because we can annotate PDFs in a, ver in a variety of ways. Uh, Adobe offers their Acrobat Reader, um, their Acrobat Reader program for free. Um, you can download that and it allows you to mark up and just put text boxes right over the PDF. Um, if you have a Mac, uh, there's a built-in application, it's called Preview. You can put a, a, um, a, a text box right onto any PDF and mark it up. If you are working with students in teletherapy, you would be sharing your screen. In this case, there wouldn't be a way for you to do this in a two-way um, thing, but you can um, model it for them. Um, in Google Drive, if you put a PDF into your Google Drive, meaning you've uploaded that PDF file, you can open it in something called Docs Hub. And that could be collaborative, that you both could be working on the same document um, if you would like. But you could consider those as being like expository conversations. Um, looking at some other 
um, online places that give you ideas for, uh, for lessons. I recently discovered that one of my favorite series of apps is also um, available as interactive websites and, or an interactive website. So you could consider an interactive website as something that you can manipulate and let information unfold and let students make some choices about what's going on on the screen. Whether or not you're giving them cursor control, you don't necessarily have to. Um, I find that I've been doing tele, you know, teletherapy for five weeks now, and the situations in which I give students cursor control is pretty limited, and they still stay pretty engaged. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be doing that um, in order to, to make this work. Um, looking, for example, this is Tiny Bob Schools. You can get a free trial. It's a pretty lengthy trial. Um, they're offering for teachers at this time. So if you go to the website, you can check it out. And Tiny Bob's made these great apps for, uh, for years. And uh, the apps all show these systems. Um, and they call um, what's on this website their uh, models. Okay, so they're uh, basically models of different kinds of systems. And this one is the, um, the human body. And uh, each website or each you know, model has some teaching resources here. Um, there's a handbook. I strongly encourage you to take a look at the, the handbook. The handbook could also be used as a following activity because it's written in kid-friendly language. Um, and um, this one in particular, it may not load because you know technical difficulties here and I'm, we're screen sharing and yeah, we're in a webinar. Uh, it, it might do better on yours. Um, but with these different models, you can, uh, you can interact with them. This one shows the systems of the human body and you can drag over um, you know, food uh, and it will go through the digestive system or in the nervous system one, you can drag over different stimulus, sti stimuli like a, a flower you hold up to the nose or a bug which stings the person and then you can see the, the impulses move through the body. Um, and those are great examples of you know, how um, language is embedded in that topic that the human body is made up of systems. Each of the systems is made up of organs. So you can list the organs or you can describe the sequence of how the system is used if it's sort of a sequential um, thing like the digestive system. So do check that out. It's just an example of you know, kind of what to do. Um, and you can make your, own, uh, make your own maps that would go uh, with those. And um, you could do this with either through the PDF or through, um, through creating your own and slides there too. Um, there are a lot of great places that provide um, expository context through, um, through e-text. And I'm gonna just show you just briefly a few of them. Um, and you know, we could use these for narrative language, um, some of them, or they're also filled with expository context. And now that you know, um, to look for list, sequence, description, compare, contrast, um, and so on. You'll find them in all sorts of places. Epic Books for Kids is not just free for now, it's always been free for educators and it's like a Netflix for children's books. Um, some of you may use News ELA, which allows you to look up current events, articles, and change the reading level even so it's simpler. Unite for Literacy is much simpler, I'll show you that. Tar Hill Reader is used by a lot of um, uh, interventionists with students who are using AAC, but it provides simple text um, and ReadWorks is also something that's available. So just taking a look at uh, taking a look at these, so you can see them. I have some of them open in uh, in these other tabs here. So um, Epic Books for Kids. Um, when you go to the website, just apply for. You don't even have to apply for. You sign up for the educator account, and it gets you right in. And I just looked up national parks, and they're all um, all these texts that are great visual uh, texts that you can uh, use. I'm trying to find, I'm a national parks freak and it's just like so sad to me right now that they're closed because people are stupid and they crowded them. Um, but um, that's probably, you know, for the best at this time, but uh, they're books. So uh, I've spent a lot of times in my teletherapy groups finding books that, uh, that I can review with a group and what it allows you to do is just use this arrow and you can move through this. So this one describes the park and its ecosystems. So be, think about that. Once you get used to this, you'll notice ecosystems, huh? There's gonna be a list, all right, and so forth. And um, you know, any kind of e-text could be analyzed with students as, as a literacy activity, but also 
you know, building the foundations of, of literate language they need to access, in this case, science and social studies, really. Um, both of those things are kind of uh, uh, you know, represented in a book about national parks. Unite for Literacy is free. You don't even have to log in. These are very, people were asking about um, in the chat, um, what structures might you teach to very young kids? Um, a lot of what's on Unite for Literacy is uh, lists or sequences. So you can guess animals that swim, okay, is going to be a book about animals that swim and it's gonna have more than one of them. Uh, and penguins swim and elephants swim. Can you think of other animals that swim too? Um, have the student make predictions and visualize around the topic. Um, and then your follow-up activity could be, let's talk about all the animals we learned about that swim. Um, Newsy LA, um, this is an article uh, here about how Hawaii is embracing um, aloha print masks. The, the key feature of News ELA is that you can um, go right here to the reading level and you can knock it right down. I'm not a literacy specialist, so I don't always know what these things um, correspond to, but um, that will make it a simpler article. Um, and uh, in this, it talks about, you know, why people suddenly want masks or what are the effects of wearing masks. Um, so cause and effect. Um, and there's also here kind of a story that you could use as a, as a sequence or you could do problem solution. Um, and so any of these structures can be used and there isn't necessarily one right one to do. Um, this is from Tar Heel Reader. I thought it was funny because uh, I'm afraid of escalators actually. I, I think I learned that from my mother, okay. Um, my mother would be afraid she was going to trip on escalators. And now like at a convention center, I, I'm afraid of heights too. So, um, you know, I, I saw this one because it amused me and I'm afraid of them. Uh, what are escalators? Um, it, it involves what are escalators. You can find escalators in buildings. You can use them to ride up and down a building. We use them because of this reasons, but um, Tar Heel Reader tends to be repetitive text, but you can find escalators in the mall or convention centers. Um, so we can make a list of places that you could find escalators. This is just an example of the kind of text um, that you can uh, do with Tar Heel Reader. And um, this is ReadWorks. ReadWorks is also free for educators. Uh, and similar to um, News ELA, uh, just has tons of examples of, um, of expository articles. So those are some, uh, some e-text things. I'm going to try to uh, wrap up in like the next five minutes and allow for questions because I know we're uh, we're over time already, which is okay. Well, it's okay for me. I hope it's okay for you. Um, so what we were talking about was oh, so when we looked at the Tiny Bop um, website, um, that's an example of what you call an interactive website. Um, I put in here some other places that you can find interactive websites. So for example. Um, the Utah Education uh, Network has, uh, a, it's like a compendium uh, of interactive websites. And here, um, if you go to Utah Education Network, um, and I'm going into science here, they have activities like Switch Zoo, and they have activities like a Lunar Cycle Challenge, which would be naturally a sequence. This shows you too, if the, app, if the application is built or the interactive website is built in Flash, which should still work. It still works for me in Safari. Supposedly Google Chrome is going to um, phase it out, but, or HTML5, which is actually better and more modern. Uh, but states of matter, for example, are, are a topic for us to uh, work on lists. What are the things that are usually liquid, usually solid, usually gas, okay? And, and we all might, you know, all of those things might move between them. Um, but for any interactive website, this one is, ooh, I'm living dangerously by clicking on something I didn't te test right beforehand, so, but we'll see. Because we're recording and things, it might not actually show it, but okay. Um, the, the key to interactive websites is they give you something to show to students and um, usually uh, you, if you are using Zoom, you could give them cursor control so that they could interact with 
uh, with the website itself. Um, or if it's visually engaging enough, usually asking students to make choices about what's going to be on screen uh, can be really fun as a, you know, and you do the click and dragging uh, piece. Uh, let's just see. Uh, I also mentioned Google Earth, and I'm a huge fan of Google Earth. Where did we pop into in Google Earth? We're in like a street view here. Um, I think we're in New York City. Um, and uh, no, this is San Francisco, I think. And uh, Google Earth is a great, uh, it's available in Chrome, in the Chrome web browser. And it's a great way to take students to places, do virtual field trips, and that's social studies connected, but you could be exploring a list of the landmarks that are there. How do you get from one place to another? That would be a sequence, a description of a particular place. Um, and Google Earth allows you to either zoom right up to a, a location uh, just by uh, doing the zoom, um, or you can go into Street View and you're going to be able to uh, walk right down that street and you can explore the street. This was actually Lombard Street um, in San Francisco. Um, so uh, that's going to be manipulable. It's not quite Lombard Street, but you get the idea. So uh, Google Earth is another uh, option for visual places that you can bring uh, students and then using the, uh, using the icons uh, to explore it. Here's actually Lombard Street, the windy street. Okay. Um, and I found this from uh, there within Google Earth. They have some, some featured content. This one shows you that. Uh, they have some featured content, including some of the world's most famous streets. Um, so that in itself could be um, a great list activity. Uh, I tried to spend some time the last couple of weeks that was supposed to be um, vacation week for our students and and that didn't happen um, by using Google Earth and taking them on trips and having them pick places uh, to organize their own tours so um, that shows zooming right into a place where you find the uh, famous streets and some other content is here in the little steering wheel and they have you know quizzes or editors picks um, including the um, famous uh, famous streets or national parks. Um, it's just a really good um, resource to check out. Um, apps, people often ask about, can you use apps in teletherapy? Um, and you can, I actually on my website uh, just yesterday, um, two resources I wanna point out on my website, which is speechtechie.com. Um, this is a free resource. You don't have to, there's no ads even on this. It's just a labor of love. Um, you can share your iPad screen during teletherapy and it would just be a screen sharing situation where students would uh, be able to make choices and I recorded a little video here about how to do that if, if you weren't sure about how to do that and um, I also have on this uh, on my website up in the corner here a teletherapy resource list. This is under construction. I've been trying to just sort of vet um, resources I know about and that people have been talking about that are, are kind of modern and available. It has a list of uh, interactive websites that are useful in teletherapy. These are all ones that I've looked at recently and, and should work well for you. Um, but if you continue down on the list, there's also a list of apps that would be useful to show students over teletherapy because no matter what you do, you really can't give them cursor control unless you jump through some hoops, which I've described on my uh, blog as well. But just showing them some of these interactive apps um, can be really uh, useful in um, teletherapy. So I'm sorry that some of those interactive websites, when I went to pull them up, didn't really want to cooperate. But um, I have been using them in uh, in therapy sessions, not through a webinar, and they've been a, they've been a lot more cooperative than that. But that's sometimes kind of the nature of the game. So um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, Sheila, is just take some time to see if there's a few questions I can respond to too. Um, so I'm gonna go down here. Um, okay. Yes, there's so, definitely a few questions. I think people, I don't know if you saw them as, as they came in the chat, but uh, yeah, people definitely had some questions for you. I'm gonna start with Pam's, oh no, that was not Pam, sorry. Kim Lynch, um, Kim asked, 
how do you do cursor control? It's a feature that's available in some platforms. Um, I'm not sure broadly how many platforms have it. I know that Google, uh, Google Hangouts Meet does not have it. Um, but when you are sharing your screen, so you have to first share your screen in the Zoom menu, for example, if you're using Zoom, there's a little icon that says remote control. It won't be there if the student's on a Chromebook because you can't give the student that, all right? Um, but you just uh, select the student's name when they pop up um, and you are able to give them cursor control. Um, Susan asked, how would you use the icons in Google Earth? Like how would you use them for a list? Well, what you would do is you're gonna be sharing your screen in order to navigate through Google Earth. It's not a good idea to have the students navigating through Google Earth. Um, it's a little too unstructured for that. Um, but you would have another tab open maybe with a Google slide and the list icons put on that Google slide um, and you could do say a list of <laughs> bug, um, a list of, of um, landmarks within the location that you're exploring. Um, I'm trying to see. Um, uh, and I just was going to stop in and say, someone said Sean could do a whole hour. Sean could really <laughs> do like two days, Sean or more. Sean does a whole day on this for us when we do our expert trainings. And Sean did, a, well, a month ago, do another hour. And we really should have Sean doing like a much longer <laughs> we could sit and learn from sean all day i agree but anyway thank go you. ahead thank you um yep that's all and someone asked is this all on the handout yep um it, epic books for kids is a separate website from readworks deborah asked yep those are on the handouts they'll be listed for you um let's just see um, this is more a question for you, Sheila. Pam asked, she has an older version of Theme Maker. Where do you find the PDFs for Theme Maker? Yes, if you do have an older version, um, email me. I'm going to write my email um, at the bottom and um, I can get you the, um, the code. If you have a newer version, um, the code should be on, I think it's page two or three of all manuals, have the codes for everything. Um, and I know somebody else asked too, while we're on that subject about, um, I'm just gonna show you really quick uh, where to find some of the things we're talking about. Um, wait a minute, oh, am I on? Someone asked, someone asked where the blog is, so can you show that? Yeah, so that's, clicking? okay. So here's our website um, and if you can, okay, so this is the website. Um, if you want to find our blog, it's right here where it says blog, and then you click Mindwing blog, and you can, there's a search. So, like, say you search like Sean, um, you'll see all of the, the um, sh blogs that Sean has done for us. So, if you're looking for something, if you're looking for Sean's blog, it's speechtechie.com. And I'm going to link that um, with our uh, professional development. Another thing, if you're, if you're looking for the recording as soon as possible and you haven't gotten the email yet tomorrow, it's under webinars and it will be right, it will be right here at the top. Um, right here is last week's, so um, it'll be right after this, and you'll see see where it says like presentation slides, webinar handout, certificate of attendance. You can get all that there. And then the other thing people had a question about was how to get the distance learning products, like the downloadable um, uh, icons. So that would be click distance learning, and then you'll see it comes up and part of it is that we have free icons available with some of our kits. So we have our quick start kits with free icons and then you have, um, these are all of our digital icons. So the universal digital icons kit um, is 1995. It's got 104, sorry, 127 icons total. Um, and that's all of them. But you can also purchase, if you, if you know you're only gonna use StoryGram or Marker, 
um, you would do you would get that one and it's a little bit less expensive. Um, you get a, a, a license to download them and then like Sean mentioned, you can save them and save it in a different file. And actually um, for this, just until midnight tonight, um, we have a sale, which we don't usually do these very often, things like this, but um, because we know there were a lot of new people, um, people new to Theme Maker, you can get the whole Theme Maker kit um, for 25% off and you get free Theme Maker icons. So you're actually getting about almost $60 savings um, with all of that. You get all of the Theme Maker materials and you get the digital icons. So I, I wanted to make sure you knew about that. We were trying not to really talk about um, selling anything in a lot of these presentations because we really do um, you know, we're doing these webinars for free and we're doing them now because we want to be able to help. But every time we do one, people say, well, I wanted to know where to buy them or how to get them, how to use them. So I realized that it's, it's okay if we talk about, <laughs> about where to buy things. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's on mindwingconcepts.com. I'll put the, I, the, in case you don't know our website and that special is through, um, the end of the night, uh, the end of the night tonight, midnight tonight. Um, let's see, Sean, um, UEN website. Oh yeah, I already responded to her. Um, oh, you did, okay. Uh, yeah, Janet was asking about that UEN website. And so, you know, you can think of interactive websites as just a good resource that are out there. Um, they allow you to do a lot of clicking and dragging around like curriculum topics. Sometimes they unfold like a story or sometimes they present information or sometimes they work more like a game. Um, and one strategy I often use when I'm trying to find, you know, an interactive website related to a science or social studies topic, like say the class is doing trees, you know, or they did trees, you know, just look, Google interactive website trees and see what comes up, you know, or interactive education website trees. Um, and you can find lots of things that way um, and just kind of add them into your repertoire. Always try out an interactive website before you use it with a student, you know, because I've done stuff that I'm like, oh, this is like way too easy or this is way too hard. Um, so uh, you always wanna kind of see the, um, the, the flow of those. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle, to answer your question, the, um, the, the slides that I showed on the, um, during the presentation list all the websites and those are um, all gonna be in the handout that Sheila puts. Together, yeah. Yes, and um, people were asking about CEUs. So um, the CEUs, will, it, there are no ASHA CEUs in the, for the registry offered. Um, we have because we're offering these um, once a week. We typically need eight weeks to register something with ASHA for it to be part of the registry. Um, if we waited eight weeks, it would be. July or August, and we want to be able to offer these for you free and now. And so instead, in lieu of ASHA CEUs on the register, we're offering a certificate of attendance that can be used um, for certification maintenance hours or for any of the, any of you that don't use ASHA that, you know, need um, other professional hours, um, you can use those um, for that. So. I know in Massachusetts too, around the teletherapy requirements, which were pretty much waived for professional development, they were at, they're now asking, um, it could be, di it's different from place to place, but asking SLPs to get 10 hours of PD within four months of starting teletherapy. And they don't say CEUs, they, it, the language of it says 10 hours of training. So log stuff like this that you do, and then you should be able to be, you know, fine. Yes, and we are we are going to send an email tomorrow that um, is a follow up that will give you the link. But really, the link is going directly to our website. So, either later tonight or very early tomorrow, you'll be able to download your um, certificate right from our website where I showed you. Um, and and yes, this it, it will. Re thank you for mentioning it. It was longer than we thought, so I will make sure it reflects the ninety minutes rather than. Um, the one hour. So <laughs> lucky you all. <laughs> and then just, oh, so I'll just mute myself and then you. Mary Ellen muted herself too.
<laughs> well, anyway, I thanks. just I just want to say thank you to Sean. Oh, I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for having me. It's a great opportunity. I always appreciate help. everything you do. And I learn something every time, of course. And <laughs> Sheila, I want to thank you for all the animation and getting me organized in my chair. <laughs> okay. So, thank you so much um, for coming. And thank, thank you, Sean. As always, you are awesome. Um, and this was another great um, another great collaboration so cool thank you thanks for having me all right talk to you soon sean all see right, you everyone you. stay thanks, well everyone. please okay bye stay well